Okay, so welcome to our virtual speaker series, the first one for 2023. Um, my name is Dr. Emily Bamforth. I'm the museum curator here at the Philip J. Curry Dinosaur Museum, and we're very happy to welcome you this afternoon. Uh, we have a very special speaker for our first virtual speaker series today. Um, Dr. Haley Street is joining us from Edmonton. Uh, so Dr. Street is currently an instructor at the Department of Bi Biological Sciences at McEwen University in Edmonton. Um, her first exposure to paleontology came while walking along the riverbanks of eastern Virginia looking for fossil shark teeth. Haley studied geology and environmental sciences at the College of William and Mary, where she realized that many of her term papers for upper level geology courses had paleontological themes, even for her class about igneous and metamorphic rocks. Haley went on to receive a master's degree at Marshall University, where she described a plesiosaur from Wyoming with an unusually flattened body shape. After her master's, Haley returned home to Washington D to the Washington, D.C. region and spent two years as a volunteer research assistant with the Smithsonian Natural History Museum. She moved to Edmonton to pursue her doctorate at the University of Alberta, studying mosasaurs with Dr. Michael Codwell. Her dissertation focused on reviewing the species that had been assigned to the genus Mosasaurus and determining how those species were related to one another. Following her PhD, Haley spent three years as a curatorial assistant at the Royal Saskatchewan Museum, uh, where she worked with me, which was awesome, um, and learned about Saskatchewan's ancient terrestrial ecosystems. Uh, Haley's been teaching introductory biology and zoological classes at Grant McEwen for a year, and she continues to research ancient uh research ancient marine reptiles um and so with that uh, i'd like to hand the floor over to dr street hello uh good afternoon everyone uh is the sound working first of all excellent thank you um before I begin with my presentation, I would like to acknowledge that I am speaking to you from uh, Treaty 6 territory, which is the ancestral territory of many different Indigenous groups, including the Blackfoot, Cree, Dene, Nakota Sioux, and Salto. They, and along with the Matisse, have been uh, caring for this land for countless generations, and I am very grateful to have the opportunity to continue to learn more about the natural wonders of this territory. And all of the different groups of uh, reptiles that I will be talking about today, um, marine reptiles from the interior of Canada have been found from this region. Not necessarily all within uh, Treaty 6, but the whole of Western Canada. So, uh, Emily did give the a bit of an introduction about me, but to say that again with some pictures this time, Yes, my first fossils were fossil shark's teeth um, from Eastern Virginia. And my exposure to uh, much of the natural world besides just going to soccer practice in very urban North, uh, Northern Virginia, my parents took me um, on vacation to the national parks in the Western US. And uh, they still do to this day sometimes. They are my uh, personal patrons of science. And so those are some of the early factors that shaped my interest in the natural world, but I wasn't necessarily one of those kids growing up, I wanna be a paleontologist from the time I was really little. Uh, that really more started uh, when I was an undergraduate at William & Mary taking geology classes. And yeah, my term papers kept tying back to paleontology, even in classes when they really should not have. I, uh, did a little bit of work with my undergraduate paleont uh, paleontology instructor, uh, Dr. Rowan Lockwood, and her fossil expertise uh, is marine invertebrates, so clams and shells and things like that. But I quickly learned that I did not have either the patience or the eye strength for all of the microscope work that uh, invertebrate paleontology answers. Um, and so, I started to pursue vertebrate paleontology. And yes, I did go on to do a master's about this little plesiosaur from Wyoming called Tatenectes laramiensis and its sort of funny flattened body shape. After my master's, I did uh, get to spend two years helping out at 
the uh, Smithsonian Natural History Museum, helping a few different curators there. Uh, before moving to uh, Al Alberta, moving here to Edmonton to pursue my doctorate uh, at the University of Alberta, where I did focus on mosasaurs. Uh, before joining Emily at the T-Rex Discovery Center for three years. And if you're not familiar with um, mosasaurs or plesiosaurs, hopefully will be by the end of this talk because those are two of the groups of marine reptiles. And you're not here to hear me talk about myself. You're here to talk about, here to hear me talk about these marine reptiles. So what exactly is a marine reptile? First and foremost, they are not dinosaurs. Marine reptiles are all found on a different branch of the reptile family tree from crocodiles, dinosaurs, and birds. Some of these marine reptiles are actually very closely related to living snakes and lizards. There is a massive variety of diversity um, within the oceans. You can see here some pictures of uh, some living marine organisms, and this only represents a smattering of the diversity of marine vertebrates or animals with a backbone. And among marine vertebrates, there are two categories, not necessarily of organisms that are most closely related to each other, but of sort of lifestyle. And these are um, the primary, primarily aquatic vertebrates. So these include um, fishes and sharks. These two lineages have spent their entire evolutionary history in the water. So today's living examples live in the water and all of their ancestors did as well. Approximately 375 million years ago, one lineage of fishes developed adaptations that permitted them to leave the oceans, leave the water and walk on land with four feet. These animals are known as tetrapods, these four-footed land walking vertebrates. But why am I talking about uh, land vertebrates in a presentation about marine reptiles? Well, that is because some uh, marine animals, in fact, all of the marine mammals, all of the marine reptiles, any marine birds, are what we consider to be secondarily aquatic. So all living and extinct marine reptiles and mammals are descendants of terrestrial tetrapods. So these are animals that descended from tetrapods that lived on land. And the fact that these lineages have returned to the water, returned to an aquatic setting, is what makes them a secondarily aquatic reptile. So uh, marine reptiles are not fishes. They do still have to breathe air and they have other adaptations uh, that are the result of the fact that some of their ancestors did in fact live on land. There have been many, many groups of marine reptiles um, over evolutionary history, but we're going to focus on three of those today. And those are the ichthyosaurs, or um, this group kind of looks somewhat similar to today's dolphins, only they do still have uh, back flippers and their tails are vertical as opposed to being horizontal like dolphins today. Then there are the plesiosaurs. The Loch Ness Monster is usually modeled after a plesiosaur with a big long neck and big flapping paddles. And the third group, are mosasaurs, uh, which if you're at all familiar with a Komodo dragon, uh, mosasaurs kind of look like a Komodo dragon with adaptations for water. They're not directly related, but somewhat close. But take a Komodo dragon, give it paddles, give it a big long tail, throw it in the ocean, you more or less have a mosasaur. So those are the three groups of marine reptiles that I will be uh, talking about for the rest of this presentation. This is a map from the website called the Paleobiology Database, and these different spots here represent uh, localities where 
marine reptiles have been found in Western North America. Uh, the purple represents the oldest of these from the Triassic. There are one or two blue dots from the Jurassic, but most of these specimens come from the Cretaceous. But how in the world are we finding marine reptiles, marine fossils of any variety in the middle of North America, which is for the most part quite high and dry today? There have been numerous times in Earth's history when sea level was significantly higher than it is today, uh, largely due to the lack of polar ice caps. And all of that water flooded over the continents, uh, not necessarily over the entirety of the continents, but uh, places where the continents were lower did flood and oceans covered them. So these continental seaways uh, were usually much shallower than the open ocean. And that shallow water is really good at supporting a wide diversity of life. So this has happened many times during Earth's history and even multiple times just during the Mesozoic, just during uh, what's commonly known as the age of dinosaurs. So we will uh, explore some of those today. First, we're going to go back to the Triassic. So about uh, 220, 210 million years ago. And talk about some ichthyosaurs from that time. At that time, most of the continents uh, were all united into a large supercontinent known as Pangaea. But this is what North America would have looked like at the time, sort of crushed into South America, Africa, and Europe on this side and Alberta would be right around here. And there's a little bit of an inlet coming in uh, towards Alberta. BC hadn't fully formed yet at this time. And uh, from this little seaway, some absolutely massive fossils have been found. This is a photograph of Shonisaurus zikaniensis on display at the Terrell Museum in Southern Alberta. Uh, Shonisaurus is the largest marine reptile that has ever been found so far. Uh, this particular specimen is about 210 million years old and in life it would have been 21 meters long, the head alone is as big as a person. So this specimen was collected uh, in uh, British Columbia um, by multiple people contributed to the collection of this, but it was led by uh, the late Dr. Betsy Nichols of the Terrell. And uh, she was one of the researchers who described it. So to get a little bit of an idea of how big a 21 meter long marine reptile would have been. We've got a, a person here in blue. Shonosaurus would have been this red figure up on top. Absolutely massive. But even though it was that big, it was probably not a vicious predator. It most likely uh, ate small fish and squid, and maybe even uh, ate them by suction, by uh, slurping up these uh, small prey items. So that is uh, an absolutely massive ichthyosaur from the Triassic. Moving on to the Jurassic, we're actually not going to talk about the Jurassic for very long at all. Um, this is how North America would have looked during a part of the late Jurassic. And there was a seaway that flooded uh, part of Western North America. It was known as the Sundance Sea. That little plesiosaur that I described for my masters came from, uh, from the Sundance Sea in Wyoming. And uh, just due to some of the sediments and some of the other aspects of the now preserved Sundance Sea, we're fairly certain that its outlet, outlet was through Canada to the north. However, if you look at this map, and if we've got Alberta here, and British Columbia forming over here, this outlet is pretty much where the Rocky Mountains are today. So 
uh, this uh, seaway from the Jurassic, any evidence of that has been crushed as the Rocky Mountains were formed. And we just don't have uh, those rock layers preserved well in Canada today. So as interesting as some of the Jurassic was, we are moving right along to the Cretaceous. And from the Cretaceous, we do have many examples of both plesiosaurs and mosasaurs. For most of the Cretaceous, North America was cut in half by a uh, continental ocean known as the Western Interior Sea. And this seaway stretched from today's Gulf of Mexico all the way up to the Arctic Ocean and sometimes across to what is now Hudson's Bay. The exact extent and shape of the Western Interior Sea uh, changed dramatically over the millennia, the exact width and depth uh, rose and fell, its uh, boundaries moved, but uh, the seaway was home to a diversity of fishes, sharks, and marine reptiles for uh, many millions of years. And uh, this is the seaway that deposited most of the marine layers that um, are currently excavated and exposed uh, for paleontologists to investigate. So first we will talk about uh, some plesiosaurs from the Cretaceous. There have been uh, many different groups of plesiosaurs throughout the Mesozoic, a uh, variety of different body shapes and forms, uh, but by the end of the Cretaceous, uh, which is the most easily accessible layer uh, today, just because it was the most recent, there are basically just two groups of plesiosaurs left, the polycotylids and the elasmosaurids. Now, polycotylids had relatively larger skulls and shorter necks. They were considered to be more active predators, uh, animals that could swim uh, pretty quickly, after their prey and use their larger, stronger skulls to consume larger prey items. So they were much more uh, active, uh, voracious predators. Elasmosaurs had much smaller skulls at the end of a big, long neck. Uh, we'll talk about just how long in a few minutes. And elasmosaurs are more considered to have been ambush style predators, which kind of makes sense with that big giant long neck sticking out with a little bitty head at the end, the pressure and forces of water swimming through that at high speeds would probably not be very good for the neck. So it's more thought that elasmosaurs would sort of sit and wait. And uh, if they saw something swim by, they could put on a quick burst of speed uh, to catch it that way. Or another uh, hypothesis is that because the neck was so long, they could sort of lurk in the shadows, maybe around reef systems or uh, underwater rocks, things like that, uh, keep their body kind of hidden. And then, you know, that little head at the end of the long neck, that didn't seem like such a big threat to their prey. And that they would be more easily able to pick off um, fish or squid or other small prey items in that way. So different body shapes, different predation styles, uh, different food sources, but they were all uh, carnivorous. This is Nicosora borealis, and with its uh, shorter neck and relatively large head for its neck length, it would be considered uh, related to the polycotylids. Uh, this specimen was found in uh, a syncrude oil sand mine in. Uh, northern Alberta, near to Fort McMurray. Uh, the left forelimb was lost. In this image, it is a reconstruction uh, because as you might imagine, coming from an oil sands operation, this specimen was in fact found by heavy machinery. But uh, fortunately, the people operating the machinery recognized that they had uh, run into something unusual and uh, contacted 
the province and the Tyrell Museum was able to go up and uh, collect it. And this is just one of the many examples of how industry and fossil collecting can actually work really well together. Uh, several of the specimens I will show you, uh, particularly those from Alberta, were found by industry, whether it's the oil sands uh, up in the north or um, a different kind of mining operation uh, farther south. So if Nicosora was an example of a polycotylid plesiosaur, Alberta Nectes van der Veldi is an example of one of the elasmosaurids. Uh, so one of these with the really, really long neck. In fact, Alberta Nectes holds the record for the largest number of neck vertebrae of any vertebrate. Uh, its cousin elasmosaur from the States, known as elasmosaurus, uh, held the previous record. Elasmosaurus had 71 or 72 vertebrae in its neck, but Alberta Nectes has 76. That is a whole bunch of individual uh, bones in its neck. In life, this reptile would have been um, over 11 meters long, uh, or even up to 12 meters, and seven meters alone of that was just the neck. Scientists still are trying to understand exactly what the advantage was of having a neck just that long, because growing a neck that long and then supporting it in the water, having the forces of the water not break the neck, uh, it seems like it would be a very uh, costly adaptation for an organism uh, to have to constantly be uh, controlling that neck in the water. So it's still not absolutely clear what the advantage was, but maybe it was that feeding style being able to sort of lurk and uh, catch prey that don't really notice how big a threat the animal actually was. So uh, those two plesiosaurs were from Alberta. This next one, Terminonotator pontixensis, is known from Saskatchewan. So it was another elasmosaur, so a long neck, not as long as Alberta nectes. Uh, I think it was about 40 or 50 vertebrae in its neck, uh, but a similar overall body shape. And one thing that's interesting about uh, plesiosaurs, elasmosaurs in particular, is that they are very often found with stones in their stomach cavity. And these stones are known as gastroliths. And uh, paleontologists are fairly certain that these stones were actually in the stomachs of these animals and that they didn't just sort of wash in uh, during the process of fossilization. These stones can be found actually in between the ribs, not just sort of lying on top of the ribs or below them. So they were actually within the body. And the fact that they are found with so many different elasmosaur fossils all around the world, and that usually there aren't these kinds of rounded pebbles around the specimen, these are indicating that these uh, pebbles were inside the body when the animal died. But why were these uh, elasmosaurs swallowing these stones? There were two main hypotheses for quite a while but I never quite bought either of them. Neither of them completely made sense. Um, the first was that uh, these stones were being used somewhat the way uh, birds today sometimes will swallow teeny stones or uh, sand and use their muscular crop, part of their stomach, use the stones within that muscular stomach to grind up their food. I was thinking that uh, plesiosaurs were also using these stones to help grind up their food sources. Except, elasmosaurs were most likely eating small fish and squid. We know this due to the shape of their teeth. Their teeth weren't strong enough to take bites out of uh, big prey items or hard prey, item, prey items that would need to be ground up. 
and also from finding some uh, remains of uh, fish or the hard parts of squids in their stomachs. Fish and squid are soft. They don't need to be ground up. So going through the effort of swallowing stones, it, that just never quite made sense to me. The other hypothesis is that they were swallowing these stones to help control their buoyancy or their position in the water column. That never quite made sense to me either. Because if uh, the elasmosaur needs the stones to be able to uh, sort of sink in the water column, the stones are at the bottom. How is it going to get to the stones if it wasn't heavy enough to sink down to get them? And also if they were like swallowing stones and spitting them out to like change their position in the water column, again, that really, really long neck, it would take a lot of energy to swallow those stones and to regurgitate them back up. It just never quite made sense to me. But more recently, I've um, seen a third hypothesis. It is related to buoyancy a little bit, but it's not for controlling the position in the water column. It's about counterbalance. As perhaps the neck grew larger and as the individual grew bigger, and reptiles can keep growing throughout their lives. They don't stop growing the way mammals do. Throughout their lives, their necks might get proportionally heavier than the rest of their body. And so swallowing some stones, it wasn't necessarily changing where they were in the body, but it could help back weight the body a little bit so the neck wasn't always dragging them down deeper into the water. It would just help keep them a little bit more stable in the water column. Do we know that's absolutely why they did it? No, but that is, of the hypotheses I've heard, that is the one that makes the most sense to me. So uh, I've mentioned to you two different uh, elasmosaurids from Alberta and Saskatchewan, Alberta nectes and Terminona tater. And when I was working with Emily at the T-Rex Discovery Center in uh, Southern Saskatchewan, uh, a hiker who had been in uh, Grasslands National Park, kind of near to the uh, border between Saskatchewan and Alberta, let us know that he had found some fossils. And they turned out to be very large neck uh, vertebrae from an elasmosaur. Uh, so very big, uh, bigger than uh, what is known of Terminotator, but we've only really got one good specimen of that. So it, there's not enough uh, of this specimen to really say absolutely was it Alberta nectes or was it Terminotator, but uh, just another example that these fossils are still being found to this day. And also, just sometimes this is how paleontology works you find a specimen, you can't always identify it. So those are some of the plesiosaurs from uh, Western Canada. There are more, uh, but that's just a smattering of what there is. I'll move on now to mosasaurs from the Cretaceous. And uh, these three uh, genera in particular, which are uh, Prognathodon, Mosasaurus and Tylosaurus. Um, Mosasaurus and Prognathodon are probably more closely related to each other than either is to Tylosaurus, uh, but they were all relatively large Mosasaurs that lived at the very end of the Cretaceous. And these would have been uh, much uh, more voracious, more uh, they would have been preying on larger prey items than the plesiosaurs. Uh, bigger, stronger teeth, stronger jaws, and a bigger uh, gape, ability to open their mouth much wider. Two different species of Tylosaurus are known from uh, Saskatchewan and Manitoba. And uh, this particular one from Manitoba, Tylosaurus pembinensis, is the largest mosasaur that has been found to date. It would have been 18 meters long. 
not saying that some of the other mosasaurs are small, just uh, they might have been more in the 10 to 12 meter long range. Possibly bigger than that, though. Uh, Tylosaurus uh, certainly has been known to eat some very large uh, prey items, uh, just the big long jaws, and also uh, Mosasaurus had some joints within their jaws. Uh, they couldn't necessarily dislocate their jaws the way modern snakes do, but they did have very mobile hinges at the back of their jaw, which did allow them to eat some larger prey items. And if you start to hear a gurgling in the background, I apologize. The hydro garden across the room just clicked on for its fill cycle. Sometimes my computer's microphone picks it up, sometimes it doesn't, but that's what's going on. Uh, so that was Tylosaurus, and that is known from both uh, Saskatchewan and Manitoba. There we go. Uh, Prognathodon has been found in both Alberta and Saskatchewan. And uh, this, uh, this species of Mosasaur and uh, the one I'll talk about next are another example of industry and paleontology being able to work well together. If you look at this photo, so you've got uh, the vertebrae, the backbone of this prognathodon going down the middle, but if you look under it, you might see some really colorful uh, shell material. And that is because this specimen came from uh, one of the mines in Southern Alberta where they mine for amylite. Uh, if you're from Alberta, you might've heard of amylite, but if not, it is uh, the particular preserved shells of a kind of marine invertebrate known as ammonites. So ammonite was the animal, but in this particular region of southern Alberta, something about the preservation, uh, last I knew they still didn't know exactly what was causing it, but causes these shells to preserve in these amazing rainbow colors, like really intense reds and greens and blues. And that is mined for jewelry and uh, just for also amazing display specimens. But ammonites were actually one of the main prey sources, one of the food sources of prognathodon. Prognathodon had these really big, heavy, strong jaws, and they were able to crush through the shells of these ammonites. So it's not at all surprising to find ammonites and mosasaurs in close proximity, they were living together if mosasaurs were eating the ammonites. And uh, the mining operations, uh, the Korite people in particular, uh, have been excellent at uh, alerting uh, the province when they come across uh, specimens of marine reptiles in their mine, which has been the source of four or five, or at this point, maybe even more really amazing marine reptile fossils. Whatever it is that helps preserve the ammonites in that really remarkable way, also does great things for uh, marine reptile skeletons. So that is Prognathodon over tonight. That is a specimen from Alberta. And this here is just the very end of the snout of a Prognathodon uh, that was in the collections at the Royal Saskatchewan Museum. Uh, big, that's, so this is just the end of the snout and it was very big and broad. So this specimen had been collected uh, just on the surface in uh, Grasslands National Park. It hadn't been part of a big excavation. It was just bits that had weathered out already and were picked up off of the ground. But one of the very Last things I did with Emily uh, while I worked at uh, the Royal Saskatchewan Museum's T-Rex Center was we wanted to go back to that site and see if any more of that specimen was left. Whether uh, several years of erosion had exposed more or if we thought we could find the site again, if we actually dug into the hill a little bit with uh, the collection permit we had, would we find anything else? 
We weren't absolutely certain we would be able to relocate the site, but at the base of this sort of slope right here, we did. We relocated the coordinates, we found our way there, we looked up around this on the surface, and there were a couple scraps of bone. We didn't uh, open up an excavation that day, but uh, just dug in a few places, and we were pretty sure there was more bone in the hill that we had relocated the site. And uh, sure enough, the next year, Emily was able to go back, and they did in fact find more. So this is part of that upper jaw, and this here at the end is that end of the snout. So it fits together exactly right. It is the same individual. They still didn't find uh, the entire skeleton, but they were able to recover more. And uh, that kind of collection story is always so interesting to me that um, these specimens, I mean, to one extent they are rocks. And so you would think they would last forever, but they really don't. Different processes go on underground or if the erosion had been too strong and had carried the rest of it away over the, the years in between the two visits to the site, it could have been lost forever. But uh, they were able to go back and find more of it um, and just add to our knowledge of this specimen. Not absolutely certain if it is another prognathodon over tonight, but it is definitely a big prognathodon type reptile. So moving on to the third and my personal favorite of uh, the, the well-known mosasaurs from Western Canada is Mosasaurus missouriensis. Uh, this one is my favorite just because most of my research has focused on that genus Mosasaurus. And this particular specimen that I'm uh, with in this case is uh, one that was collected along uh, pretty near the South Saskatchewan River in Saskatchewan. That specimen is commonly known as Max. Um, it is actually a nearly complete specimen. Last I knew the uh, head and chest cavity uh, were yet to be prepared, but beautiful flippers, great specimen. Uh, but Mosasaurus missouriensis is also known from Alberta. It's another one of those uh, Mosasaurus, one of those marine reptile fossils that has been found uh, through the mining of amylite. This particular specimen is one of my favorites. I don't know, it just looks that it's all curled up with a skull lying across its tail, even though the fossil isn't complete. And one thing that's interesting is that uh, in collections across Alberta, we actually have a bit of a size series or a growth series for this species. Uh, this specimen represents the smallest. Its skull is only, only 72 centimeters long. Uh, there's another specimen more complete whose skull was uh, closer to a meter long. And then another skull uh, that was incomplete, but proportionally would have been 110, 120 centimeters long. So, uh, Finding individuals of different sizes, of different growth stages, can help paleontologists learn more about how these animals grew. Uh, were their skeletons exactly the same shape as they grew, or did some parts of their skeletons grow more quickly than others? Uh, did they maybe live in slightly different areas when they were different sizes? Uh, being able to find multiple individuals can be really useful that way. So. If ever someone says, well, don't you have enough fossils? Why do you need to keep looking for more? This is the kind of reason why. There's only so much you can learn from one particular fossil, even if it's the best fossil in the world. Having other fossils of the same species to compare it to or having fossils of different species from the same place can really help paleontologists understand what life was like in the past because each fossil is pretty much just a snapshot. But if we start to build them all together to layer them, we can really add depth to the story. So I hope you've enjoyed hearing about uh, these different marine reptiles. And 
even if Western Canada looks something like this today. I hope I've explained a bit about how we were able to find these marine reptiles in places that look like this. And that's because at different points in the past, they might have looked much more like that. Different inundations of seas uh, multiple different times over Earth's history. And with that, I will happily take any questions. Perfect. Thank you so much, Haley. That was awesome. Lots, lots of good memories of hunting marine reptiles in Saskatchewan there. Um, I did so, distract Emily with marine reptiles every chance I got. <laughs> and there's a, I said, Western Canada is a great place to look for marine reptiles for sure. Um, so if anyone who is watching has a question, um, feel free to type it into the chat uh, in the YouTube chat there. Um, and I'll just keep an eye out for, for questions as they come in. Um, I did notice that that someone really likes Terminator in the uh, in the chat there. They said Terminator, woo, which is which is pretty awesome. Um, so I guess I will, as people have a chance to type in their questions there, I'll start with a question. Um, so here at the Curry Museum, we have a big mass, uh, big cast of um, Pronathodon. I'm sorry, Tylosaurus. Peminensis, the one from, from Manitoba. Um, we also have a corn snake in our gallery, a corn snake called Peanut. Um, could you maybe just speak to the connection between mosasaurs and snakes? Absolutely. So when I was describing mosasaurs at first, I said that they kind of looked like um, a bigger Komodo dragon with paddles instead of legs. But um, I also said that Mosasaurus and Komodo dragons aren't directly related to each other, but snakes on the other hand, probably are the closest living relatives to Mosasaurus. So Peanut and that cast of um, Tylosaurus pembinensis would have shared a common ancestor. Um, they're not, I mean, it's not two species that are directly connected, but they're part of bigger lineages that are uh, related to each other. Cool. Uh, so question from Lori in the chat here. Um, I'm curious, have you heard of ammonite and pterosaur fossils found in the gut contents of a lasmosaur? Yes, I'm pretty sure about uh, some pterosaurs. I don't recall hearing about any ammonite fossils as gut contents in elasmosaurs, but elasmosaurs have also not been my particular uh, pleasy sort of study, so I certainly don't know everything about them. Um, it is possible that elasmosaurs um, could have done some fishing at uh, the surface of the water. They probably, let's see if I can scroll back here to the very beginning. They were probably not able to bend their necks up in this sort of like swan pose that they used to be just uh, shown as. Just the way their neck vertebrae fit together, they wouldn't allow for quite that much bending. But uh, there were some pterosaurs that were thought to hunt also at the surface of the water. So if the last mosaur was already there, they might have been able to lunge just enough to grab the pterosaur and not need to sort of flex their neck too much to get that. So another question in the chat here, do you have any future research about mosasaurs, uh, if you don't mind sharing? Um, well, I'm laughing to myself because I have a, a whole pile of research left over from my dissertation that I need to finish off. So, the short answer is yes. The long answer is very much yes. Um, the research for my dissertation, so I was looking at Mosasaurus and how different species of Mosasaurus are related to each other, or if some species that are currently called Mosasaurus should not be called Mosasaurus and should be given a different name. So that's my first project. Um, but I do also have collaborations with 
uh, some other researchers around the world um, describing species related to Mosasaurus, um, things like that. So plenty of things I would like to look more into. Uh, I've only just started teaching at McEwitt, and so I have to spend a lot of my time pre uh, preparing my lectures and everything. So I don't have a whole lot of time uh, for my own research on the side, but hopefully as I get a little bit more used to teaching, I'll be able to start adding the research back in and spending some more time on it. That's cool. Um, just a note in the chat here from Lori again. She says, if you like, I could email the link to a really thorough blog post about plesiosaur diets. Um, okay. So that would be awesome. That would, yeah, that would be awesome, Lori. If you could put that link maybe in the chat there, um, that would be awesome. Um, yeah, that might be the best best way to do it. Then I can um, pass it on to Haley or Haley, you'll be able to see the, the stream as well. Um, so you can okay. take that too. Uh, Lori also asked, do you have a favorite Californian marine reptile? She likes Plotosaurus. Yep, that is also one of my personal favorites. Uh, the skull, uh, one of the particular skulls of that uh, genus of Mosasaur, uh, which is fairly closely related to Mosasaurus, is just so immaculately preserved. I wanted it as a puzzle. Uh, when I got to see that specimen uh, in person, it really helped me understand how parts of the back of the skull of Mosasaurus fit together. So what often happens with marine fossils in particular is um, they'll either be preserved in three dimensions, but sort of all broken up. And so you'll be missing bits or they'll, you'll get the entire skull, but they'll be kind of flattened. And so you might not get as many views. That skull of Plotosaurus is three dimensional. It's complete. It was just kind of such a pivotal part of my, uh, research and understanding how bits of the skull actually go together that yeah it's my personal favorite as well how many californian marine reptiles are there are they they're pretty common um depends on which piece of literature you're reading how many species there are i think many many species have been described i think a lot of those has been synonymized over the years but they do have um, a few different species of mosasaur and a few more uh, plesiosaurs. So I also had a question about uh, Nicosaurus, so the, the one that was found from Fort McMurray. Uh, do you know what the age of that was? I'm Cretaceous, obviously, but... It is older than... Um, the, the other specimens that I talked about, I don't remember the exact age, but it would have been from um, earlier in the Cretaceous. So rather than being sort of 72-ish million years, which is how old pretty much everything else I was talking about, this would have been, I don't know exactly, but I want to say somewhere around 100 million years old. Okay. That's cool. The, the reason I ask is we have a specimen on, the, on display at the museum here um, that is the gut cavity of a polycotylid um, and was collected from Peace River, uh, from the Peace River, I mean. Um, so I'm just wondering if it could potentially be this specimen or not. We'll have to send you some pictures and get your opinion on that. But it's, um, I don't think the plesiosaur fauna up here is particularly well understood. Um, mm -hmm but it would be great to find more for sure. Yep. All right, that's cool. So I'm not seeing uh, any more questions in the chat there. Um, so once again, thank you so much for Haley for being our speaker today for a super interesting talk on marine reptiles. Um, they're very, certainly an important part of the, uh, the fossil history of Western Canada. Um, and they tell us an awful lot about the time when Alberta and Saskatchewan were beachfront property, which is not uh, not something that is particularly easy to imagine right now, as, as Haley was alluding to. Um, if you do have any more questions or if you are watching this uh, not live, this this again will be um, 
remain on our YouTube channel for anyone who wants to watch it afterwards. Um, so if you are watching this and do have questions, um, feel free to email me um, or I can uh, forward the questions on to Haley as well. Um, so lots of ways to get a hold of us there. Um, so once again, thank you so much for watching. Um, we will hopefully see you again next month for our next virtual speaker series. So uh, keep in, keep up to, sorry, keep watching our um, social media for our information on our next virtual speaker series. Um, so once again, thank you very much. And, thank you for having me. Yeah. And I will uh, just stop the stream here. So thanks again. Okay, I don't.